Thanks, Sophie. You're watching Southeast Today, our top story tonight. A Christmas crackdown as police warn that drug driving is increasingly seen as acceptable behaviour. A last-minute strike brings Eurostar and Eurotunnel services to a standstill as the festive getaway begins. We've got the latest on the travel disruption. Born to be almost wild, the first bison conceived in Kent is now roaming woodland near Canterbury. I dreamed a dream in time gone by. Carrie comes to Crawley. We chat to West End star Carrie Hope Fletcher about getting booed and hissed on stage in Panto. And I'm live in Brighton where 28,000 people will be lining the streets for the Burning the Clocks Festival. Welcome to the programme. I'm Natalie Graham. We start tonight with the rising concern about the amount of drug driving on our roads. As police tell us, more and more offenders see it as acceptable behaviour. So far this month, more than 450 people across Kent, Sussex and Surrey have been arrested in connection with drink or drug driving. In Surrey, drug driving arrests have exceeded those for drink driving. And drug driving is now believed to be a factor in one in 20 road crashes. Our investigations reporter Josie Hannett has been given exclusive access to patrols in Kent as part of their Christmas crackdown. Oh, shit, please, I stay where you are! Stand still! We'll send the dog, get down here now! Get down here now! Lads, you've got nowhere to go, there's cops everywhere. I've got two to take. Five teenagers arrested in Dartford, suspected of stealing a car, driving at high speeds and failing to stop for police. Excellent work. Well, that's um, all of them in custody now then. So there's definitely um, trace elements of drugs. You can smell it in here as well. So they're likely going to be drug driving. It's such a massive deal. Um, we unfortunately go to a lot of fatal crashes um, in the role we do and to see people die through drink and drug driving and to have to tell their families that their loved ones are dead. Um, so to get these people off the street is a massive result for us. It minimises the risk to the public and makes sure that anyone who uses the road network, they're safe. People are choosing to make off from the police and drive dangerously, putting other road users at risk, especially by driving the wrong way down a carriageway. Um, generally it's because they have got drugs in the system or something they want to hide from the police. As part of the annual festive crackdown on drink and drug drivers, Kent Police Roads Unit has been stopping those they suspect are committing other traffic offences, then testing them for substances at the roadside. OK, and stick it out for me, please. Thank you. The taking of drugs and drug use is seen generally by uh, the, the generations at the moment that are driving that is quite acceptable. It's quite a common thing and it's just seen as recreational. And I think the misconception is with people that do drug drive is that if they've taken a drug, it's going to go out of their system quite quickly, so it wouldn't matter. But what people don't understand is that it does stay in your system for a matter of days, um, which can mean that you still will be over the legal limit if you drive. A drug drive rehabilitation course is being trialled in the north of England in a few months' time. The scheme by the Department for Transport will see those convicted of drug driving who've already served a prison sentence or a driving ban given an educational course. It could mean cheaper car insurance when they get their licence back. Lily Lockwood's family know all too well the tragic impact driving under the influence can have. She was killed by a drug driver. They disagree with the pilot. They shouldn't be doing it in the first place. You know, it sort of shows where this country's going um, when they'd rather spend money trying to re rehabilitate people um, who've done wrong rather than come and speak to the victims' families first. The government says it could help prevent reoffending and keep people safe. Some charities agree rehabilitation is necessary. Definitely it needs to be rolled out nationally, so there's already one for drink driving. And the idea is that um, these people have an addiction, so just taking away their licence, they could still go out and drive without a licence. What you need to do is actually stop them having the dependency on drugs, so these courses are really important. Officers from across the southeast will continue these patrols into the new year. The message is clear, don't risk it this Christmas. 
Well, Josie's with me now. And Josie, it does seem, doesn't it, that drug driving is a bigger problem for the police and also a more challenging one. It does, and actually on that night shift with those officers, they were very candid in that they feel that it has become more of a problem. So they say that whilst, you know, the people they pull over for another offence, often they are caught dr drunk, drunk, uh, dr drug or drink driving, sorry, that's a mouthful, and uh, they might pull multiple people over in one shift, and that is uncommon. Now, this month of action has caught hundreds of drivers, that's all well and good, but they can't catch everyone. Another challenge that they face is that that roadside test specifically for drugs is not evidential so the person who they've caught has to go back to the station to have further tests to see what drug they've taken and how much and obviously we know that takes time it does Josie thank you now in the last few minutes cross channel rail services have resumed after an unexpected strike in France brought them to a standstill the action has been affecting Eurotunnel which runs trains to and from Folkestone and Eurostar which operates passenger services to and from London there are also delays at the port of Dover well earlier people on both sides of the channel told us how their pre Christmas travel plans had been affected it's been extremely frustrating uh, period of time um, and uh, yeah I mean we've obviously had the expense um, when you don't particularly need it with the cost of living um, and an additional expense of uh, you know over 150 pounds for us to book new train tickets and then to book new ferry tickets. What are we going to do when are we going to make it how are we going to get there um, and also we're looking at what hotels and things are available in the area for um, bedding down for the night and if we have to take a ferry in the morning, um, which I'm dreading. It's very frustrating. We've looked to find even flights to London and it's just really difficult to find anything without a uh, long connection or a, a long uh, delay. Well, traffic on the M20 has also been affected by the disruption. Sarah Smith is by the motorway now. Sarah, things are moving behind you. What's the latest? They're moving, but slowly, because they closed the motorway. It's been closed coastbound at Junction 8 9 since about 4 o'clock. So I'm six or seven miles further up, so uh, before that closure. But over the last couple of hours, uh, traffic has been backing up beyond here. And they do that because those lorries, which would usually get on trains down at Folkestone, because they haven't been able to get on the trains, they then park them on the empty motorway down there. The idea being that... They can try and keep the rest of Kent's um, roads relatively free moving. There have been problems in Dover as well because people have been heading down there trying to get ferries so they can get across the channel that way, although people have been told not to turn up there without a ticket. So all in all, a pretty miserable start to the holidays for lots of people, those people on passenger trains in London, in Brussels, in Paris sitting on the trains, heading off, they thought, for their journeys and then being turned back, ending up where they started. People in uh, traffic queues here in Folkestone, in Dover. And now, great news that the blockade is being lifted tonight, but the backlog, it's still not clear when that will be over with. Well, let's hope they're not stuck for too much longer. Sarah, by the M20, thank you. Now, first came online shopping, then the pandemic and then energy rise, rising energy costs. It's been a challenging few years for the high street. But now, with just two full shopping days to go until Christmas, retailers are hoping a jump in last minute sales will ease some of the pressure. New research shows footfall is up this time last year, but still lags behind pre-pandemic levels. Victoria Bourne has been out and about taking the temperature. Last minute Christmas shopping. Some stores are benefiting from a boost in sales this festive period after a difficult year of trading. It has been one of the toughest years we've been here. We've been through everything from recession to Brexit, Covid, roadworks, but this has probably been the hardest one because of internet shopping, being able to do it at home. What frustrates us is if people think we're more expensive than the internet, it's not always the way. We can match internet pricing. I know it's more convenient to shop at home, but you can't beat talking to somebody or trying things on. That's a view echoed by shoppers in Uckfield. I love shops. I'm terrible. I'm not, I don't go online and um, I go find things in shops. I prefer the high street. If I can come to the high street, that's better. Most days, actually, I, I shop and, um, yeah, I get everything I need. It's all there. Find online 
you can do that anywhere in the world. Yeah, it's convenient sometimes, but um, still prefer a good bit of interaction. Figures show one in nine shops on the southeast high streets are empty, which is a slight rise on pre-pandemic levels. 4% of those have remained vacant for three years or more, which is a steady rise since 2019. And whilst footfall on the region's towns and shopping centres was up slightly last week on the same period last year, it's still down 17% on what it was in 2019. In Ashford, some of the big chains have shut up shop. This summer, Katie Ramsden closed her refill store, which had been open for just over two years. Every time one business in Ashford or any town closes, it has a knock-on effect on the businesses that remain. You know, various things like car park closures helped my demise along as well. Some businesses have had to change how they operate to survive. Currently, I think it's probably our most difficult time, uh, apart obviously from uh, lockdown. Lockdown forced us to uh, consider the online world and trying to put together an online shop, which is helping hold up the business um, because the actual trade through the high street is pretty dead. So I think the high street will continue to um, adapt and evolve, but I think it's a lot more agile now. Um, and, and as I say, consumer habits do change. Uh, I think things like working from home, I've also seen a lot more of the retailers maybe opening in more suburban locations or commuter uh, towns. Um, with people spending less time in sort of the big city centres. With the cost of living adding to pressures families are facing this Christmas, some retailers have noticed a change in the way their customers are spending. People are more wary of what they're buying, how much they're spending. We do a savings club, so people come in throughout the year, choose what they want, put it by, give us a deposit, pay it off throughout, and a lot of them have already collected, which is really good. We have had an early rush, but the last couple of days it's been really good. We're having a, you know, a good day today as well. The retailers here certainly hope that people will continue to shop local well into the new year. Let's talk to Victoria, who's in Uckfield for us. Certainly the shoppers you spoke to there earlier, Victoria, seem quite enthusiastic about physically doing their Christmas shopping on the high street this year. How has it seemed to you today? Well, some of the retailers that I've spoken to have said that trade has picked up this week as people are trying to get gifts at the 11th hour so they've got them in time for Christmas. But a recurring theme is that dwindling footfall is really making life that much harder for some of the small businesses out there. Now, a couple of shopkeepers that we've spoken to today have told us that what could make a difference is if a larger brand or even a small department store moved into the town centre to help draw more people in. Thank you. Now the first bison to be both conceived and born in Kent is now roaming woodland near Canterbury. The birth is part of a groundbreaking collaboration between Kent Wildlife Trust and the Wildwood Trust to show how animals like bison can improve the biodiversity of our natural landscape. Our environment correspondent Yvette Austin has our story update. Meet the latest addition to the bison herd of East Kent. Born last month, this calf is doing well, already foraging for food and learning the art of ecosystem engineering. Fortunately, we don't have to do an awful lot to look after the calf. What the calf needs is the reassurance from the herd, particularly from mum, the matriarch, where the calf will be learning. He'll be learning and guided by the group. They'll be there to protect her, look after that animal. Um, and all of those things that the, the bison will be feeding on and browsing on and grazing from, the calf will be learning. She'll be observing, watching what happens and, and really knowing how to become a bison. The calf brings the herd's number in total up to six. Introduced into Bleen Woods near Canterbury last year, their job is to breathe new life into the site, shape the habitat around them through their natural behaviours, bringing light to the woodland floor and boosting biodiversity. This is about trying to manage these woodlands in a wild way, as they would have evolved naturally several thousand years ago before human intervention. So it's about reducing our intervention. It's about increasing the dynamics in those, those ecosystems. It's about a more natural management of those areas. And it's also about proving that this can be done and, and beginning to challenge some of the regulatory um, barriers that we're seeing increasingly being imposed on projects like this in the UK. The bison's home is a fenced area of more than 130 acres. It is, though, a challenging time of year to be born into the almost wild. 
The bull, it seems, was quick off the mark in making friends with the ladies, and so plenty of extra hay is being provided to see them all through the chilly months. We have to be mindful of their welfare. They're an endangered species themselves. We're growing that herd back up internationally, and this is a contribution to that project. And the calf has been born really out the wrong time of year, um, and, you know, it's cold, and we need to make sure that there is enough food there, particularly for the mum, because the calf is suckling so much. The plan next year is to give them even more space to live in and work on, more than quadrupling the size of their habitat, more room for more babies. Yvette Austin, BBC South East Today, Bleen. Let's hope we get more babies. Now, thousands of people are lining the streets of Brighton this evening for the annual Burning the Clocks Parade. The ceremony, which marks the winter solstice, was launched 30 years ago in 1993. It involves a lantern parade through the city streets and then a big bonfire on Brighton Beach. Well, Claudia Sebasis is in the city for us this evening. And as usual, as we can see, Claudia, it's drawing a crowd. Well, there are 28,000 people on the streets tonight. There are 2,000 people in the parade. And take a look at some of these lanterns. They're homemade, they're made of paper and willow. And the whole idea is that they're filled with your dreams, your hopes, your wishes for the future. Now, the parade is meant to go down to the beach where they're going to be burnt in these big bonfire, all of the lanterns. But they've had to cancel the bonfire tonight because there was due to be lots of high winds. But you know, the winds dropped. It's not really windy at all. You can see. Never mind, they're going to have a firework display. And it's the 30th anniversary of this parade. And every year they have a theme. And this year's theme is clocks. I think uh, we wanted a really great reset, especially after coming back last year and after COVID. We wanted something to kind of show how do you measure time? How do you bring all these moments together? How does he uh, do kind of passage? We are starting to ask these questions. We want to make a bunch of time pieces, one for clocks. Now, this is all about marking the winter solstice. And solstice actually means that the sun stands still. And that's what ancient cultures used to think happened. They used to think that the sun suddenly died and was reborn. And that's what this festival is marking. It's marking the start of midwinter for all of us. It's also an antidote to the sort of commercialism of Christmas. The idea is to bring the community of Brighton onto the streets to celebrate together. Claudia, no one standing still there this evening. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Well, as we've just been seeing, Brighton is known for its lively culture and its beaches, but it's also fast gaining a reputation for developing some of the country's leading gaming talent, with new companies springing up in the area. In fact, this region now employs more people outside of London in the industry than any other area. Piers Hopkirk has tonight's special report. Games at the seaside, well, they've moved on. Just a bit. With the South East revealed as the second largest hub of games development talent in the UK, Brighton's becoming a major player. It is the go-to place for people to come and live and work, and work in the games industry specifically. So it's a creative hub of awesome. There are now more than 20 games companies in the city, making it a major mover in the UK's multi-billion pound gaming industry. Games by their very nature are really multidisciplinary. They bring together musicians and even you know, voice actors, even performers, coders, artists, animators, illustrators, all these things. And as anyone who's spent probably even a moment in Brighton knows, it's a creatively diverse place. So games and Brighton are a kind of natural fit for each other. The newly released Assassin's Creed Nexus, the latest instalment of a giant gaming franchise, was developed and published by Ubisoft, working in collaboration with Brighton's Electric Square, transforming the gameplay into virtual reality. And then this gets you into the world. You can now move around the environment. And I can actually see my hands. You can see your hands. So this is one of the brilliant things of VR, is that it brings your hands into the environment and makes you uh, an actor in the scene as well. Uh, the future for Brighton, uh, the games industry, is very, very exciting. The amount of talent that's attracted here, the innovation that's happening. Across the southeast, the sector employs just under 5,000 people. It's growing at a rate of roughly 12% and worth around £3.68 to the UK's GDP. Trailer Farm in Brighton builds creative content for game makers. 
but their work's expanding into virtual production for TV and film. So we've been used to creating virtual environments for years in games, but what we're now able to do is apply that to industries such as film and TV and create the backgrounds and the environments that you want to have for any given situation. Um, and you can do that at any time of day, night, in any location, creating worlds from anywhere on Earth or in space or wherever you can imagine. There's also a focus on extending the reach of games, helping creators adapt games and games hardware to make them more accessible to all. Game developers can make relatively minor accommodations that can be made, but that can radically improve the size of the audience and the number of people and reduce the people that will be excluded by that, uh, by that video game. In a city proud of its inclusivity, it's another step forward as gaming technology marches on. Piers Hopkirk, BBC South East Today, Brighton. Now, if you're a fan of musicals, you'll instantly recognise our next guest. Carrie Hope Fletcher is the Grammy-nominated star of some of the most successful West End shows. She's also a best-selling author and vlogger. And this Christmas, she's heading a panto cast in Crawley. We're going to chat to her in a moment. First, let's see her performing. I dreamed a dream in time gone by when hope was high and life worth living Cold and uncaring, constantly staring Solely concerned with what you were wearing Gossip and shopping, I'm the opposite of everything you are One of life's little jokes I know I have a heart because you broke it Well, Carrie joins us now from the auditorium at the Hawth and your in-between performances. How was your first one this afternoon? It was great. It was amazing. We had a great audience. They all seemed to enjoy it. So, yeah, just getting ready for the, for the second one now. And they've cleared up all the glitter in between, I'm pleased to see. You're, you're playing Cara Boss, um, yes. a baddie. So a lot of booing and hissing. Is that, is that hard to take on stage or quite fun? <laughs> no, it, it means that I'm doing my job right. If they're not booing me, I feel like I'm not being evil enough. Um, and my character is called Carabos, but they've changed it slightly for me because my name is Carrie, so they've changed it to Carrie Boss for this particular production. Love it, love it. Does it come naturally then, being a baddie? It is a lot of fun being a baddie, I will be totally honest. I really, really enjoy it. Um, I feel like they have the most fun. I feel like I've got some really good numbers in the show as well. I get to sing Hellfire from Hunchback of Notre Dame and Pinball Wizard. Some really cracking tunes that I get to sing. Oh, it sounds amazing. How does it compare then to being on the stage in the West End with slightly more serious shows like Les Mis with Andrew Lloyd Webber, that kind of thing? <laughs> Yes, I mean, it is very different. Um, and I did my first panto last year, which was um, Sleeping Beauty as well. So I'm, I'm reprising my role as Carabos. Um, but it, it was a bit of a shock to the system to suddenly have the audience shouting back and singing along and booing and cheering and laughing and joining in with the it's behind you and oh yes, oh yes it is and oh no it isn't, all of that. But it's just magical. It's so wonderful to see families come and watch yeah. Panto and just be able to express their enjoyment of the show. It's a great British tradition, isn't it? Now, unlike last year in Canterbury, you're seven and a half months is. pregnant this year. So how does that work with costumes? I know you've got a <laughs> fantastic pair yes. of horns on there. Presumably they haven't had to be adjusted. <laughs> I do, yes. <laughs> No, the horns haven't, haven't had to be adjusted. They are exactly the same fit as last year, luckily. Um, <laughs> but the dresses, I'm, I am wearing diff a different set of dresses this year that have all been elasticated <laughs> and they're all slightly bigger and they're all sort of corseted at the back so they can be adjusted if they, if they need to for the <laughs> ever-expanding bump. You also have to keep your energy levels up. You've got two shows a day, pretty much. One day off at Christmas, on Christmas Day itself. So what's Christmas yes. Day going to be like for you? 
Christmas Day, we yes, like you said, we have it off. We do two shows on Christmas Eve, two shows on Boxing Day. So Christmas Day is the sweet spot in the middle. Um, and I'll be going to my, my brother's house with my husband. Um, everyone sort of piles into my brother's house. Uh, and yeah, we have a, a very Merry Christmas. It's great. I hope you do, Carrie, and I hope you get a well-earned rest in between your performances <laughs> at the Horth and the arrival of your baby in the new year. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Now, it may be the shortest day of the year, which means it got dark very early, John. But the sky gave us a little bit of an early Christmas present, didn't yeah, it? Yeah, in the midst of darkness, there <laughs> is light. And these are the pictures to prove it, Natta. Yes, it was dark at half past four, but you weather watchers out there were taking these pictures of uh, shimmering clouds way up in the stratosphere, about three times the height of Everest, which means the sun was still shining up there, even though it was dark down here. These are nacreous clouds, very rare. And they occur when, uh, well, the stratosphere is particularly cold, forming ice crystals, which were glowing in the late sunshine. And nacreous comes from the old English for mother of pearl, and you can see why, can't you? So that was a real treat earlier on. Uh, now it is well and truly dark, and it is well and truly mild still, isn't it? That mild air still being propelled by that strong jet stream, which has been pushing those nacreous clouds across the sky. And we're going to stay on the mild side of that jet stream for the next few days, up to and including Christmas. So a lot of mild weather, a lot of blustery weather, as we've seen today. Uh, no sign of snow, probably some rain up to Christmas. Now, we've had some rain today, bits and pieces, no great amounts, but uh, most of that has now faded away southeastwards. So it is uh, dry out there at the moment. And as Claudia said, down in Brighton, the wind has begun to drop out a little bit. Still a bit of a breeze as we head through the night, but it shouldn't cause too many problems. And we'll see some more patchy rain turning up as we head towards morning time. Mild again, no problems with frost. Temperatures down to seven or eight at the lowest. Now, it might be a rather dark start to the winter solstice, uh, a lot of low clouds and drizzly stuff. That should tend to ease off. The sky should brighten to some extent and uh, hopefully you'll see a bit of winter sunshine through the afternoon. Still very mild, 10, 11, 12 degrees, but still that blustery wind. Looking further ahead into the weekend, it stays mild, it stays blustery and it stays pretty dry as well. That dry theme continues through to Christmas and beyond. The cold air way to the north of us, hence no prospect of snow. Any more nacreous clouds though? Well, fingers crossed. Keep Let's looking. hope so. Yeah. John, thank you very much indeed. I feel educated now. Good. That's it from us tonight. I'll be back after the national news at 10. See you then. Bye bye.